welcome to this uh, panel on uh, records and complications. Uh, my name is Pascal Rafsou from the FHH and we are very glad to host these panels for you today that is going to be moderated by Susan Wong. Uh, so I leave you in her expert hands as of now, Susan, please. Right, good afternoon everyone and thank you Pascal for that effervescent welcome. Thanks to the audience for coming to our panel discussion, even though it's you know, right about lunchtime, I promise you once we get into the discussion, you will not even be thinking about food. So first of all, I'd like to introduce the panel, starting from the far end across from me, the endlessly erudite Michael Friedman, head of complications at Udma Piguet. To his left, we have the incredible Pierre Halimi, head of Epijon in North America. And then in the center here, we have the venerable and witty Christian Sermoni, heritage and style director of Vacheron Consultant. And uh, finally, we have the... Uh, <laughs> Ever scintillating, ever <laughs> fascinating, and ever enigmatic William Massena, uh, watch expert, collector extraordinaire, and uh, keeper of the power of Grey Skull. I'm Suzanne Wong, I'm editor at large of Revolution <laughs> Watch magazine, and I'll be moderating and playing Extreme Devil's Advocate, so don't at me. How are you today, gentlemen? Are you ready to answer some tough questions? Always, yes. Okay, let's start off easy. I want you guys to think about. What's really stood out to you over the last few years in terms of memorable watchmaking records and complications? Because that's what this panel is about, ladies and gentlemen. And try not to name your own brand's work in this question, gentlemen, because that's not going to fly. Shall we start with uh, Michael on the end? Wait, you want me to talk about record-breaking complications and not mention... Well, it's just something that stood out to you, you know, without, you know, bigging up your own... Well, that will come a bit later on. It'll come... No, I... I listen... We're in an incredible era with the development of complications right now. Part of that is thanks to this marriage that's taking place between advanced technologies and traditional watchmaking. Um, the era of complications over the last 30 years has been largely possible because of the incorporation of CAD and CNC and these tools that watchmakers and technicians are able to utilize that weren't possible when I was born, for example, and before that era. So that's the first sort of acknowledgement we have to make with complications, is that there are new tools in the field of watchmaking that has helped elevate this field in new directions. With us, we embrace these tools wholeheartedly at Audemars Piguet, because we're so confident, we're so rooted in the hand finishing, that we like to sort of peel back that layer and show how the whole system works. And I'm, I have to speak through our lens, only because of the Super Sonore Minute Repeater, and the RD2, this is the thin perpetual calendar. Well, our approach is to take the traditional classical complications and see how we can push them into the next level for the next generation. It's not about breaking records, it's not about doing things more or better, it's about challenging the watchmakers and the technicians to create, to innovate, and to really try things that had not been done before. When I look at the broader watch community, it's happening with many, many brands as well, even with the panel over here. And I should take a quick moment. I mean, F.P. Jorn, Vacheron, William, this is incredible colleagues to be up, up with right now. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that, Suzanne, for now. For me, it's really this, the underlying theme here is that we have tools to create complications that weren't possible one generation ago. Okay. Uh, maybe Christian? Yes. I think what we, when we are talking about uh, records and complications, I think really we have to talk about our clients. I think something which is very important that uh, since uh, 25 years or 30 years since the, the rebirth of mechanical watchmaking, I think our clients have, have been very much driving the driving force into, uh, for, for us watchmakers into creating fantastic complications. And um, I'm thinking obviously a little bit about the, the most complicated watch ever made in history, mm. which, is, which is a watch that was, which is a bespoke timepiece that was ordered by one of our clients and it took us eight years to, to, to complete this watch. And so in that case, I think the, the client really, uh, this is the, maybe the best example in which uh, our clients is really challenging the brands in order to create uh, more and more and new complications. I think this mm -hmm. is something which is very important to me. Mm -hmm. Pierre, do you have an opinion on this? What do you think are the most kind of outstanding records and watchmaking complications that you've seen over the last few years? Um. I need to disagree with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Michael on a few things and also you. Uh, I'm French, it's normal, it's part of the territory. Uh, why are we doing records and complications? Why? 
What I do not like and doesn't make sense uh, is when you do a record for the sake of marketing. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the problem that I have with this. Okay, so so and so now we agree. Now we now we. Uh, uh, what I don't like about this is is we're doing records. I have a friend called Paul Gerber, you know, from the Academy uh, uh, the Créateur Indépendant, and he did. 25 years ago, 27 years ago, it's in the Guinness Book of Record, a little clock this big, it's the size of a stamp, and except the spring, everything is in wood. Why? And I asked Paul, why? And the only person he sold it to is, to, is me. I bought it because, you know, I, you know, it was amazing. But it doesn't make sense. If you go back to the history, and we're talking basically Breguet, you know, in the 1800s, because there's a before and there's an after, and we are in the Breguet, you had this scientific uh, era with the Berthoud Janvier, you know, you know more than I do about this, called scientific watchmaking. They were scientists, more than anybody else, you know, at that time. Then you had in the 19th century, you had what we call the democratization of time. So it was the cheap watches. Only till like, you know, this 80s technically, when there was the rebirth of the Swiss industry, that we see new complications, new way to approach this. But it was what, a century and a half? Right, that's what mm -hmm. I was touching upon with the advanced technologies leading to that. Leading to that. Mm -hmm. So, but you as collectors or journalists, do not go into the marketing part. When some people, I'm not mentioning the, the brand, because I'm trying to be nice, uh, say, oh, we have this record, and why? We have 17 complications, because the record before was 16. Why? What? Mm -hmm. No, I, I love that point of yours, and this is why I'm very happy to have you on this panel, William, because I know you've got good opinions on this very subject. I mean, are there records and complications that have really received a little too much attention, like maybe what Pierre was describing? Because I think if there's one question we don't really ask enough in this industry, it's so what? You know, yes, it's the thinnest, or it's the loudest, or it's the most complex, or blah, blah, blah. But so what? Why do we care so much? Well, first, I have nothing to say. <laughs> no watch to sell. Um, I think what's important is uh, Into the mic. you can translate the question to um, why do we race car? Why is there Formula One? Yeah. We all have a car. Why do we go to the moon or in space? We don't need to. And it's the drive. It's we really need to do this stuff. The Formula One, the, the, the work they put in Formula One was implemented in the car you drive every day. The stuff that we're doing 20 years ago is being put in your car today. And it's a bit the same with watchmakers. They, they're driving to do bigger stuff, more complication, more this, more that. And at some point, those complications, those small little improvements, will get into the mechanical watch that everybody can buy. Mm -hmm. um, Christian uh, talked briefly about that big pocket watch, which is the most complicated pocket watch that they made four years ago. Yes. And uh, you look at that watch, and it was made for one client, and you're like, OK, so what's the point? It's, it was millions of dollars, it took them eight years to make it. The point is that two or three years later, they came up with a, a wristwatch that had an equation of time that was an amazing watch. I think it was SIHH 2017. But that watch, you could see, was influenced by the big pocket watch that they made. The super grand sonry from AB is the same thing. They're designing those super high-tech carbon fiber cases, and those at one point would get into less expensive watches. So you have to shoot for the moon in order to be able to improve everybody's life. Mm -hmm. That's a very strong point. I like how you brought up the complicated watch of Vashran Kosuta. Um, Michael and Pierre, do you have maybe any experience of how uh, incredible concept watches and research and development have actually made a difference in daily, everyday wear watches that are more relevant to your you know, uh, regular consumer? Well, absolutely, because it shifts the dialogue. It's also the process that's changed so much. For our development of the Super Sonore, we teamed up with the Ecole Polytech Federation of Lausanne, which is like the MIT of Switzerland. And for us to develop that watch, it wasn't about creating the loudest repeater. We were actually, the quest was for purity and for resonance. And we went beyond watchmaking. We studied neurology. We looked at how the body transmits sound. We look at the best frequencies for the ear to process sound. It was really an uh, experience in, as much in science as it was in horology, which touches upon what Pierre said. That was the origin of complications. Remember, the, the history of science and technology is inextricably linked to watchmaking and clockmaking. 
and it still is today. The Hadron Collider is linked to the atomic clock. The whole history of the scientific revolution is because of the invention of the pendulum and the balance wheel. We forget this today because watches are fashion and aesthetics and style, but they were life and death. Watches and clocks were really tied to the progress of humanity as we know it today, the whole history of humanity. But unlike other objects of technology, they were always richly decorated because of what time represents, because of what time means to culture. These relationships, these ancient relationships, which really even go back much further to pre-mechanical timepieces, this is something that we keep close to the heart. Many of the companies here keep this long relationship at heart. It's not, horology is more than watchmaking. It's the study and philosophy of time as well. So for us, we need to leave watchmaking sometimes to then bring those lessons back to the, back to the center. That's what we did with the development of, of RD1, that super array. We needed expertise beyond the field of watchmaking. And that changes the whole dialogue it brings other people into the mix, it brings new conversations, and it's that key reminder that watchmaking isn't separate from culture, it's central to culture. It always has been. And that's what's been the amazing thing that's happened over the last couple decades is we've all seen this industry evolve massively. This events like this itself is because we've opened up that dialogue so much and are peeling back layers and showing how interconnected all of these things are. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested to throw this question over to Pierre actually because I think one of the most uh, beautiful and yet esoteric watches I've seen uh, in my professional career is the Econometa Resonance. And does this support what you said earlier about the, you know, the why? Is it, is it practical or how, how, how is it useful? How, what does it impart to the customer? Well, the resonance is the, um, I remember when we launched it back in 99, it was impossible to sell. Because we had the tourbillon and, you know, people say, oh, I know what a tourbillon is. They didn't, it doesn't matter. I think they thought they, they knew and they could compare. And the resonance, they could not compare. Because mm -hmm. nobody else is, uh, is uh, making this. I can still use uh, the, the present tense. Uh, it took about five years for people to say, ah, now I understand. And the origin is basically what we call the double pendulum uh, from uh, Breguet or from, uh, from uh, Janvier. Mm -hmm. But when, when we talk about this watch, and it's going back to the history uh, of watchmaking, if I show you this watch, I'm going to tell you this is the only wristwatch you've ever seen in your life. Big salesperson, you know, big statement. But it is the only watch that compensates for the movement of the wrist. Hence, it's a wristwatch. Because all the technology that we have, or the concept, all the way to the chronograph, when we have to use like fingers like this, where before it used to be the pocket watch, comes from the era of conversion, 1910s, from the pocket watches to the wristwatches. And there's a lot of uh, you know, difference between a pocket watch and a wristwatch. Mm -hmm. so, the resonance is, is definitely something interesting, and we're going to do a, a big retrospective next year, and we're going to go back to, you know, Jean Vier, we're going to go back to these guys to say, okay, is there a legacy for the scientific watch? Is there even, is it irrelevant at the time of the eye watch and all this? We will we'll see. Mm -hmm. At least we, we, the only thing I really agree with everyone here mm -hmm. is craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. And somebody else uh, said yesterday at one of the panels over there at the Indies, he, he, he said something like this. And then the guy in front of me said, oh, what time is it? I said, I don't know. But you just looked at your watch. Yeah, so what? I just looked at the watch. I'm happy to look at the watch. And that's the emotion that also we're losing. Records and complication, if there's no emotion, forget it. If it's just marketing, forget it. Mm -hmm. um, Christian and William, you both have lots of experience and exposure to clients. I mean, you're one yourself, William. Um, uh, would you say that end consumers are actually aware of these features and the value that they confer? What difference does it make to them and their experience of the watch in your interactions with them and talks with them about how they experience watches? Well, I think, I think the, our job is really to, to communicate about, about our values. So I think we, have, we spoke about the, the history of watchmaking, so very important inventions. Mm -hmm. I think we also, also speak about uh, craftsmanship. What I would like to say is that uh, I think for us watchmakers, we are living in fantastic times in which we have uh, the, the technology, I mean, when, I, when we speak about manufacturing, which help us really to create uh, fantastically complicated watches. You were mentioning, William, the, the, the piece from 2017, Celestia, which is a highly complicated timepiece with 23 complications. It would not be possible to make uh, such, uh, such a watch some, I don't know, 30 or 50 years ago. But I think what is very important is the fact that uh, all this watch, all the components have been hand-finished so I think this is really the point which is very important. So this combination of uh, technicality of, the, of technology as well through, through the machinery 
is, uh, is nothing without the hand of the watchmaker because the essence of high watchmaking is really the, the hand finishing and the know of the watchmaker. Mm -hmm. William? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I agree here with, with, with the panel. I think the, 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 one, the, the thing that is a collector, from a collector point of view, that you li I like the most about collecting watches is actually not so much about the watch itself. It's more about visiting the factory, sitting down with the watchmaker, seeing him work. Mm -hmm. um, if you see how they, uh, they do dials, how they assemble watches, this is the real pleasure, is mm -hmm. to see how the watch that you're wearing, how it was made. Um, uh, you, 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 cannot, you cannot experience a, a watch fully if you haven't been uh, to Geneva and see how they're making your watch. I have to admit this. That, and I think more and more of the brands are aware of this and they're trying to open that to, to everyone to be able to, to have an idea of how, we, how they make watches. And craftsmanship is the most important part today. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the technological aspect, the scientific aspect is gone. So the craftsmanship is there to stay, uh, and it's amazing work. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because that's one thing that I wanted to ask you. How applicable is that experience that actually going to visit the manufacturer, seeing how dial makers do their stuff? How applicable is that to the majority of clients? And maybe Michael and Pierre, you could have something to say about that because of your incredible uh, sort of initiative to introduce clients more and more to the manufacturer and with uh, FP Jaune, with your atelier in the middle of Geneva, beautiful place. You have to visit if you're ever in Geneva, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Mike? Yeah, this, is the, this is the humanity behind horology, and this is something that so much of the industry has forgotten and moved beyond. Much of the industry is increasing mechanization and it's increasing industrial aspects. That's okay, but the brands over here and the collector here are companies that are doing everything we can to preserve those traditional methods, to preserve those traditional techniques without ignoring the increasing uh, new technologies that emerge as well. So it's not until you go to the factory that you really experience the human beings, you see the work being done. Why is it that we only make a certain number of double balance wheel skeleton watches? We're not choosing to limit the production to make it difficult for clients to buy them. We're a family run business. We only have so many watchmakers who could do the hand finishing. And you can stand behind them and watch them filing, watch them working, increasing the size of the tools one at a time. You see it come alive. The, with us, the independence isn't just about being independent, it's about empowering the craftspeople. That's at the core of what we do. We say it all the time, we work for the watchmakers. And until we bring people into that space and they meet the men and women who are producing these watches, this is when it really all comes together. We could finish the Royal Oak by, by machine and it would look pretty good. It might even look more accurate in some ways, but then it's no longer a Royal Oak. The hand finishing of those aspects is absolutely essential to the process. It's so central to the process, it's the humanity behind the watchmaking. And it's on our shoulders as companies and on William's soldiers and other collectors to keep uh, supporting these brands because one generation passes and we stop doing this, it's forgotten, it's gone, and it's moved on. So it's absolutely essential for brands like ours, companies like ours, ateliers like ours, to keep pursuing those handcrafted elements. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pierre, do you, have a, do you have a take on this to add on to what Mike said? Oh, no, no, I was just, uh, just saying that I fully agree. I think this is something uh, <clears throat> extremely important. I remember um, when I joined the company in 1990, mm -hmm. and uh, well, I can tell that we, we were really look, trying to find not even watchmakers, but people able to, to, to finish our moment. And it was very difficult because uh, no one was really wanting to come back to, to, to mechanical watchmaking, and they, there was no real trust for the future. And so we had to we had to open uh, training workshops to train our people and to do it. sometimes you know it can, it needs years to, to, to be trained on, on finishings and I think this is something which is which is highly important and it's the, probably the most important in our activity is to maintain a life craftsmanship. With one footnote on that, we talk about the quartz crisis, how it devastated the, the watchmaking community, which is true, four-fifths of the business went down. But that same period, 1970 to 1985, Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantine, these companies grew between 1970 and 1985 because they went against the grain of the quartz technologies and revitalized traditional high complication watchmaking. Before 1980, only two companies produced perpetual calendar watches in series. It was just Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet. This says so much about how rare these complicated wristwatches were during that period. But again, these three companies grew during the quartz crisis 
because they went back to complications, revitalized complications, and recognized there was a big market for it. We saw this happen again in 2008 with the economic crisis. There was big fear that what's going to happen with the watch industry, but the companies that were producing complications with not sacrificing the work of the humans, not sacrificing the work of the people, once again we saw growth with the market on those objects. Here we are in the digital age, the digital era, getting deeper and deeper into the ones and zeros. There's this lust for the analog, there's the lust for the IRL, the in real life, and these types of watches offer a solace for this type of uh, era that we're in. Mm -hmm. I, find, I find it very interesting that uh, Michael being first a historian before being into the watch business, and I think what's, what's key, and, and Christian is also alluding to this, is what we call perspective. You can't make anything new if you don't know what happened before. It's a simple definition, uh, but they do, we do, William also uh, uh, knows, but that's what's relevant. Even in the day today where basically we don't need watches, the 18th century we, we needed watches and we need clocks, we need like to navigate at sea, even all the way the industrialization, you know, you had to punch in the morning at 8 o'clock, you couldn't be late. Before they were farmers, if you're late by one minute, it doesn't really matter, but when you punch in, you could be fired, so you need to have uh, uh, that... Uh, Remember, Henry Ford was a watchmaker, and he wanted to do the $1 watch, and he's had another idea called the 40. But his, first, his background was a watchmaker. So, so that was important. So when I want Michael to explain to you, he will do it much better than I do, the analogy with art. Because I think it also gives like a great, you know, sort of vision of, of watchmaking. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pierre makes a really good point about the, how, you know, kind of the reasons why we needed a good watch, a strong watch, a reliable and accurate watch, kind of uh, related to the past and historical reasons, no longer really apply now. And I remember, Michael, you made a good point in, on your panel yesterday about the desirability of a watch and how, kind of how that might be the driving reason behind why we purchase these objects now and making them more accessible to more people when you talk about how uh, complications are more, uh, definitely made a lot more now than they were 25 years ago. Yeah, it's, you know, when, when you look at the, at the history of, we talk about the history of art and we make these distinctions, right? We have impressionist art, expressionist, surrealistic, pre-war, post-war, and we're now into contemporary art. But at the end of the day, we're looking at canvas and we're looking at pigment and we're looking at expression. Many of those tools are the same. Many of those processes are the same. It's what we do with those tools that shifts and it's the broader cultural dialogue that shifts. What a lot of people don't realize is that when watches originated, when, they, when the clock was miniaturized to the point to where it becomes a different object, late 1400s, around 1500, the very first watches were terribly inaccurate. You needed a sundial to set it constantly throughout the day, but they had complications. So before you had accuracy, you had alarm mechanisms, you had calendars, you had these rudimentary complications on these watches that really weren't good at telling the time, but they were pretty good at those broader astronomical indications. So complications predate accuracy. And it shows how even in that era, at that point, and we know this through the historical record, we have works of art as well as lots of different surviving uh, records along those lines. So this is an interesting aspect, this relationship between watches began as objects that weren't scientific, they became scientific as Pierre mentioned, and what the quartz crisis did is it liberated watchmakers. That's why we're in this era of creativity today. Quartz watches meant, we're, here's an object that's gonna tell better time than any mechanical watch. Wow, okay, so what's the role of watchmakers now? This is this renaissance we're in with watchmaking today. We are liberated because accuracy no longer is the primary pursuit. It's a pursuit, mm -hmm. but it's not the primary pursuit. That's the era of watchmaking we're in today. This is where we have F.P. Journe and all the unusual wild independence uh, that we know of Max Bucer and Bruegel Forse. This is how Audemars Piguet was able to introduce the concept in 2002, a completely insane idea and notion. It was because the quartz crisis liberated us. Again, I talk about this because it tends to be one historical narrative of devastation, but in reality it really created the pathway of which we're still on today. Mm -hmm. I want to redirect this to William because as someone with experience, vast experience with both modern and vintage timepieces, is this a point that you can support? No. <laughs> bring, bring it on. Bring That's, it on uh, yeah. uh, there's one thing I, I, I disagree with you on this is uh, I, I like the, when you made the parallel with painting and pigment, and uh, it's not so true. Uh, there's a big difference, and the big difference is technology. They, uh, in the 50s and the 40s, and before that, they didn't have computers, they didn't have 
CAD assisting design. Today, uh, a, a, a good uh, uh, movement maker uh, can create a prototype, let's say, reasonably, within a reasonable amount of time, maybe a, a year, two years, three years, depending on the complication. 50 years ago, it wasn't the case. Those guys had to draw everything and make, you know, uh, like architects make the drawing themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the computer and the help of technology, the help of uh, 3D printers has helped the, this industry tremendously. I mean, what's killing them is helping them. The poison is basically uh, saving them. Uh, and um, if you look at it, with, uh, an observation about this, uh, in the grand realm of things, in the last 20 years where technology has gone up the roof, you really have only two brands and two real brands that have emerged. Uh, you have a lot of independent watchmakers, but brands, you have only two. Uh, and when I mean two brands, it means that they have a distribution network, that they have stores all over the world, that you know, they have a catalog. I'm not talking about a, a watchmaker that does uh, 100 or 200 watches a year and has a website, and you can go visit him in Switzerland. Uh, I'm talking about Jaune and uh, Richard Mille. These are the only two brands that emerged in the last 20 years. And there's a reason for this, because today, independent watchmakers don't need to have uh, to create a brand. They're just in a computer, a little établi, an atelier, and they can create a lot of different things for you, a lot of complication, and sell them to you from Switzerland. You can visit them, and you'll have that experience that I, I love. But they don't really need to establish a brand, and only two uh, brands have emerged in the last 20 years, which really shows you that the technology has helped a lot of independent watchmakers to be able to sell a lot of complicated things without really having a whole network behind them. Mm -hmm. It's cool that we have with us today a representative of Vacheron Consultant, which is you know, the oldest operating, continuously operating brand in the business. So maybe Christian, you can kind of give us uh, the take of a brand like that on the evolution of technology, you yes. know, the whole pen to paper kind of conceptualization. Yes, so I think first of all, uh, there's nothing wrong with tradition. I think it's very important to, to remind it. Mm -hmm. I think for us, it's, it's very clear. So. Uh, we, um, we are here since many years, and um, we think that we have uh, several uh, what we call territories of expression, and these are astronomical complications, or astronomy in general, mm -hmm. uh, stopwatches, striking watches, and uh, different time display, let's say. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, this is uh, like, uh, well, these are our traditions, and we are visiting and revisiting the, our traditions, and uh, we think that the technology, again, is here to help us to better study or better uh, find new ways, new, uh, new possibilities to create complications, but they must be, they must respect our traditions and we must uh, manufacture this complication uh, fully, um, uh, respecting fully our watchmaking traditions when we talk about again finishing and watchmaking. So I think for us, <coughs> that's where we come from and we want to continue that path and we want to do it uh, in a modern way but we mm -hmm. want to really keep our feet firmly on the ground and continue our traditional watchmaking. Okay. So that's the role we're following. That's really cool. I'm loving the direction this conversation has taken. However, I feel like we've got slightly away from the topic of it, and I want to bring us back into focus a bit by doing a bit of audience participation. I want to ask, how many people in this audience have actually worn a mechanically complicated watch? Uh, basically, one that has a function apart from just telling the time, whether it's a date, a calendar, a chronograph, show of hands. How many of you have actually used that function? If you include the date. Well, I mean, <laughs> see, that's kind of my how many, point. How many, how many in the audience has a chronograph? How of, do you use it more than three times a year, honestly? Ah, maybe a doctor in the back. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay, well, to be fair, this isn't really a representative audience. We're all like, you know, lovers of watchmaking and watches. But I think we can all see just from observations and from our own experience that people don't really have that much daily contact. And they're not as close to the way their, their mechanical watches function as perhaps we would like them to be or as we personally are. And I want to talk a bit about maybe how we can start to realign that uh, value of a watch in the eyes of the customer with the value that we give to it in the watch as a brand, as a creator. Uh, Mike, you want to kick things off? I mean, our experience is quite different. I mean, we find that our clients engage with the complications at a very intimate level. Um, they love spending time with Giulio Papi, the creator of many of our complications, not just for Rodemar Piguet, but for many other brands as well over the last decades. 
Um, that's part of our, the engagement process that we have. Uh, when we bring people to uh, Otomar Piguet, Renault Papi, where we produce our high complications, as well as the high complications for Richard Mille, uh, part of that engagement process is making your own perpetual calendar. It's of course plastic and it's a, it's a model, but that's part of the process that's done. We want people to really get a feel for what they're doing. So you look at the bench work and then you try it yourself on its own model. So with us, we find that there really is that direct engagement in the complications. People want to know why, they want to know why, they ask questions, especially these days in the era of the internet. Um, it's totally different. People can do all their homework ahead of time and have a good sense and a good knowledge. And a lot of you guys who shop in boutiques might have even found you walk into a boutique and sometimes you know a little bit more than the person selling you the watch because you, you do so much of your homework and preparation ahead of time. So I, I have a different experience, at least through our lens. Um, and uh, you know, that's from our viewpoint, I think people really do engage them and understand them and want to ask the questions and they know the principles behind the perpetual calendar. They know what an integrated chronograph is with a vertical clutch. They understand that the super sonore repeater is loud because it's hitting a soundboard and not the main plate. I think really a lot of people these days have come along to, uh, to come on board and really understand what we're going for. Okay, I kind of regret having asked you that question first because I feel like after you've said that, no one's going to admit that none of their customers know what the hell's going on with their watches. <laughs> I but let's, let's try anyway. William. Uh, I, okay, let's start with the beginning. Uh, Omar Piguet in 1986 introduced a, a wristwatch that made those three guys very rich. And that's the first wristwatch automatic with a tourbillon. Hmm. Now, a tourbillon is completely useless on a wristwatch. Let, let's, let's put it this way. Fact, tourbillon is useless on a wristwatch. Fact. I have tourbillons, I love tourbillons, but they're useless. Uh, tourbillon is like coke, it's a way for God to tell you you're too rich. Um, God's so, way or someone else's way? <laughs> so, um, there's kind of a uselessness of a lot of complication. Media repeaters are useless except if you live in a tent with no electricity and you're blind. Um, they, Keeping it real, William. <laughs> Keeping it real. Calendar, I mean, by the time you wrote the check to buy the watch, you not need. Uh, you won't have a checkbook anymore, so you don't need to know the date. It's. It, it, I mean, if you go on and on, they're absolutely useless. But we still love them. I mean, they, there's something you put on your wrist and you really enjoy having and looking at, and it's pretty, and and that's what it is for. I mean, at the end of the day, it's look pretty and nice, and you know how to use them and. I have a lot of respect for the guy who wants a tourbillon and knows how it works. Even though he knows that on his wrist it's not working properly, he knows how it works. And he knows the story behind it, and he knows that it was developed by Brick Gigs. I like that. Uh, that's the aspect of the watch that I like. Okay. Michael will probably get to your rebuttal in just a second, but let's hear from Christian and Pierre first. Can I thank William for killing the business? <laughs> <laughs> William. I mean, he's absolutely correct. Uh, with the first ones uh, to say that the tourbillon is absolutely useless. But going back to, uh, to uh, what uh, Michael said before, uh, and I see Vincent, Vincent is over there, I Vincent. Uh, I encourage <laughs> you to go and have a watch class uh, that Vincent organizes. Yes. Uh, we did this with Vincent actually in New York, and we had some uh, surgeons, neurosurgeons, and big, big collectors and friends that say, are you good with your fingers? I said, I'm a neurosurgeon, come and prove it. <laughs> he came with three other neurosurgeons, they started at 9 o'clock on a Saturday. Three of them were Jewish out of four. I said, it's okay, an exception to Shabbat. They left, I think, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, working on a very, very crude movement. And then we showed them a jaune movement. They said, oh, wow. Remember, remember, you look at the finished product, and you like it or you don't. But do you know how much sweat there is before you get there? All the problems you have, especially when you're talking about prototyping, and does it work? No, even jaune, great watchmaker is not always correct. And he says, it's because I make mistakes that I learn every day. Otherwise, forget it. That's why I say I'm against records and complications for just the sake of it. But to try to get better tomorrow than yesterday, that's the thing. Whether it's in tradition, whether it's machinery, machines are very important. I mean, even quartz is very important. If Abraham Lubeck would have invented quartz in 1801, of course he would have done it. Would have, would have, would have been a genius. Quartz is, is a, we embrace quartz, it's part of the history. It's like prostitution, it exists. So don't, don't, hide, don't hide it. So, so embrace it. Not prostitution, embrace uh, also. Oh, Pierre, yeah, you're so French. Right, well, as a representative of an 18th century manufacturer, Christian, let's have your take on this. 
<laughs> no, as in just carrying on from what Pierre said, uh, do you have a take on this and uh, you know, what William said about the uselessness of complications, but also the drive to kind of push us forward and progress? Because, you know, Vashon Kosotan, they've been here since the 18th century and it's not from sitting on their bums and doing nothing, you know? No, it's true. I, I think that, um, again, to come back to, to, to watchmaking, so, so the essence of watchmaking is, uh, is, to, is to give the time, but not only the time that it is now. So since the very beginning, they, they wanted to add some, some functions, and I think it's just uh, it's part of the game. And um, I, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's, it is what is fascinating in, in watchmaking, is the endless quest for some, something new to do better and better, and to, to reinvent sometimes complications that are existing. And uh, even if, if a tourbillon is uh, maybe a useless uh, device in a timepiece, I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to showcase again the way you can, you can finish it. And you, if you spend uh, 10 hours of hand finishing on a tourbillon, I think this is also watchmaking. So, mm -hmm. uh, so for me, uh, complications are very much associated with the essence of watchmaking, which is really to, to, to give, uh, give time indication, and more simply than time indication, and to, to again perpetuate this relation between uh, watchmaking and astronomy and mathematics and sometimes mm -hmm. philosophy as well. Right, Michael. I don't know if... So, well, I think oh, Michael's waiting for his chance to rebut. <laughs> uh, oh, but go ahead, please. I, I, it, 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 might be, it might get better for me. Closer, darling. Closer. <laughs> uh, there's one thing that um, Christian... I don't know if you noticed that... Closer. Uh, Closer. Christian has... Uh, uh, talks a lot about the craftsmanship. There's over 250 years of history uh, behind what he's saying. And if you look, it's a very subtle way brands are trying to get away from those numbers. They're trying to get away from, we have been around for 200 years, we've been around for 300 years. Uh, actually, I think Vachon dropped the uh, Depuis 1755 from the name, from, from, right, from the logo. And I think they're trying to get away from this because they, being old is not that great, let's face it. Uh, being modern and Speak trying for yourself. to uh, <laughs> create product that excites your customer is what make a brand survive. Uh, not saying, hey, I've been around for 250 years, so you should trust me. And I think it's the same for Edmond Piguet. Uh, well, Jean is 20 years old, so kind of young. But, uh, but that's an inheritor. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Trust, the fact, trust the craftsmanship, trust us today. Yeah. What happened 250 years ago is kind of useless today. Now, now can I go back to the uselessness of complications, William? Yeah, jump right so, in. So by the way, William and I go back about 20 years. We enjoy the banter uh, back and forth. It's, this is nothing new. No, for me, if, if, if complications are useless, then so is music and art, period. The tourbillon is a work of art, the minute repeater is a work of music, and all of them are the origins of the modern computer. We're talking about complications. Mm -hmm. IBM's first iteration, before they were IBM, they were ITR, the International Time Recording Company, making the punch stamp clocks that Pierre referenced. The minute repeater, you have 12 hours, you have 60 minutes, quick math, 720 different variations. A minute repeater is programmed mechanically to have 720 unique melodies. That's a computational device. A perpetual calendar is programmed mechanically to know the varying numbers of days in the month and to adjust for the leap year indicator. In a way, if they're useless, they're, so is art, so is music. Mm -hmm. So they're useless from a functionality standpoint, but that's not necessarily what the role is and what the function is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was getting at earlier, that liberation, that return to the origin of watchmaking, where it really, yes, it has the finishing, it has the tradition, it has the technologies of today, looking to the past, embracing the future, but it's also about expression and about individuality and about capturing our imagination. Mm -hmm. It's really about spirit as much as anything else, in, as well as intellect. I'm really loving this history lesson drop right in the middle of our discussion. No, it's true, but you know, the very first computers, the, the sort of predecessor of our modern computing was the difference engine of Charles Babbage, 100%. which was, you know, it was gears and wheels and all fully mechanical. And that's kind of where we start from, like the sort of basic mechanical principles. And uh, right now, I hope you guys are sitting tight because I'm going to throw something into the mix. And I want to ask you, each of you in turn, get ready. Where do we draw the line between something that's genuinely mechanically innovative and something that's bluntly put a mechanical indulgence? Have you ever looked at something and said, you know what, this is just stroking someone's ego. Uh, I can't believe you're going to try and sell this. Give us examples. Well, I said it was going to be hard. Pass the potato. Go on. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> 
go back to the incredible work that Vacheron did a few years ago. And I'm gonna, and it, it, this, was an, this was an incredible object and mechanism. It went beyond the super complications that Odomar, Patek, and Vacheron had created in the early century. But my, my, my sense when it came out was, and my colleague Kathleen remembers, we had this conversation when it dropped. I said, wow, a really cool object from Vacheron, but why, why didn't they go to Wired Magazine? Why, isn't the tech, why didn't they go to the technology world to talk about this? Because yes, the hand finishing was, is absolutely amazing. And it was beautiful, the craftsmanship was amazing. But if Vacheron had, had spoken about that narrative as being this duality of traditional craftsmanship and advanced technologies, the narrative would have reached much, much further. That, that rock in the pond, the ripples would have gone much, much, much further. And as incredible as that object is, there was a missed opportunity for us in this field of watchmaking to capture the imagination of people from the high technology world. Now, since that time, people from the technology world have been getting more and more involved in watchmaking. Some of our biggest client growth are 20 to 30 year olds out of Silicon Valley or other technology hubs around the world. And when you open up the dialogue and start speaking really clearly what William touched upon, what you guys touched upon about this duality of craft and tradition and advanced technologies, wow, this is how we're embracing the new generation. Audemars Piguet, our growth is because we're communicating directly to people from those worlds and being transparent about the realities of how watches are made today without sacrificing the traditional hand finishing. Uh, incredible, uh, amazing object, and as William said, it resulted in the evolution of other incredible complications. By the way, Vacheron did drop one of the most amazing modern complications this year at SIHH Which with the perpetual calendar that goes into rest mode. I mean, it's, the stuff is so cool. But again, to me, if I were at Vacheron, I would have been, hey guys, let's call up Wired Magazine. Let's not just talk to, uh, to the watch blogs. Let's go to the technology world as well. Let's open up this conversation. Hell, maybe we should all be at CES one year looking at analog technology. I'm serious, like this is a huge missed opportunity in this field and in this industry. Mm -hmm. You've avoided the half of the question we were really interested in, Michael. <laughs> I'm good at that. Yeah, you want to you take a shot? Which half, which half? <laughs> yes. I, no, I think I did it. I don't, I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. No, Mike, I mean, Mike to the mouth, I mean, darling. Mike I, to the I mouth. Can try, I can try and answer <laughs> it to one, Susan. So, so for me, I would say, um, uh, I would say, something it would be for me a, a new way to a complicated way to display simple time so i think for me this is something you know when you are ready to think about am i do i do i need to do i do i to try to find how to read time mm -hmm. so for me it's starting to be not so necessary okay i well, think it has to be readable mm -hmm. and, uh, so regulators jumping out and nothing so against uh, jumping out star wheels no, I mean, <laughs> Right. Oh, Watch it, William. 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 William, I know you want William. us to bring him back. <laughs> That's why I put him next to me so I could, like, you know, control that. Good job, mate. Absolutely. Yes, Pierre, please. Mike. I want to give you a stupid complication. Okay, these guys already, they're not in the company anymore and was, you know, before 2008. But that was such a stupid idea. Yeah. No one's recording this, right? Uh, and I hope nobody here in the, in the audience uh, has, has this watch. Hopefully not. Uh, hope, no, probably not. Double tourbillon, Romain Jérôme, doesn't tell time. You have two tourbillons, no hands. So I said, you know, as a sales process, it's fantastic. You no, know, after sales service problem, because we don't even know if it's accurate or not. <laughs> but, but, you know, in this era of like stupidity, they sold some. I don't know what price or whatever, I don't really care. But that was stupid. With, right now, and it's interesting what Michael said, you know, about the, uh, the new generation. Kids and uh, Gregory Dort from uh, HYD did uh, uh, on one of the talks uh, at the Indies uh, mention a, a survey that was uh, in England with young kids at school, and the kids were always asking the, the teachers, "What time is it?" You know, we have a, an exam and we have maybe ten minutes left. They could not read the clock the way you know we know it. They had to change the clocks to digital. So just imagine this: like the young kids, they don't know how to tell time from this which is not very intuitive. You know, why do you have this circle or put another circle, 60 minutes, what do I care? You know, and then you have the seconds on top of it. So you have three motions, circular motions, why? You know, time is, should be like the philosophical watch. Remember the one that you, uh, Odeba Pique did, one hand. So it was easy, well, not very accurate because you couldn't tell, but it's okay. So the kids will not know time. And I remember when Michael Teddy did shows in, in Singapore and 
in Singapore, yeah, there's, there's an indication that's unparalleled probably in the world. We had buses of kids this tall looking at all the watchmaking and asking questions. This tall. Preparing maybe the future, what is understanding. If you don't like it, you don't like it. Know it. Mm -hmm. William? And too bad for Amazon. I, I, I'm the person in maybe besides Susan here that sees the most watchers in the year. I see, I do about 40 appointments at SIHH, maybe over 100 at Basel. Uh, I see over maybe 5,000 new watches a year. That's a lot of watches. And about the same as vintage as well. And, mm -hmm. and then there's a the vintage side. I also do all the auctions everywhere. Um, first of all, you have to know that I'm the kind of guy who goes in a meeting and they ask my opinion and I give it to them like they have no idea. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I tell you this. First of all, I try to keep in mind that there's people behind the product. That's very important. Yeah. Whether it's to be or doesn't give time, there's people that have their life, you know, all the sweat behind the product. And uh, how ridiculous the complication is, I don't really care, to be honest. Uh, I'm not going to buy it, and that would be the end of it. And maybe I write something and I would mock them, or I'd mock them in public. But it's, that's not so bad. What's bad is when the quality of the product is not good. That's really what upsets me. It's when they're trying to sell you something that's really not worth it at a very high price. Whether it's a three-hand watch, or a super complication, if the quality is not there, I'm upset. And, uh, and especially when it comes from a brand that I respect, then I'm yeah. really upset. Um, but I noticed over the last 25 years that the bad guys usually die young. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the good thing in, in that story is, uh, don't mind so much the, the noise, uh, the good guys uh, uh, stays at, you know, at the end. Mm -hmm. Amazing. At this point, I'd like to open up the floor to uh, any audience questions, which I'm sure you're all burning to, to give us. Anyone? Gentleman in the front row? Yes. Uh, there's a microphone just coming your way if you wait a couple of seconds. Uh, thank you, everybody. I think this has been a great conversation, learning a lot about the industry. My question is, uh, I heard a lot about the tourbillon and how it is irrelevant for wristwatches. I know it was very relevant for pocket watches because of the vertical position. Um, what's your opinion on the gyro tourbillon? Is it irrelevant as the traditional tourbillon? Because now the gyro is in three degrees of freedom. So I want to see what your opinion is on that. Okay. So just a very quick explanation for the rest of the audience who might not know what the gyro tourbillon is. The tourbillon is the thing that goes around. Gyro tourbillon is the thing that goes around in three dimensions. There was kind of the basic primer. Even in the pocket watch, it is uh, not good. You know, basic, it's, it's a very easy process. Uh, and we did the studies. Back in Jean-Pierre Nicolet, back in the 90s, uh, in Switzerland, in Switzerland, everything is beautiful, everything but is nice, there's never a problem with watches. I mean, this is Switzerland. He, he did the test with all the tourbillons working and all the tourbillons not working. 100% of the watches were working better without the tourbillon. The reason is the tourbillon, even though we make great effort to make it as light as possible, is still heavy. So the heavier it is, you have to move it, you know, to move the carriage. Therefore, it's not as precise. It's that look, your car, if you have a trail in your car, you're gonna be as efficient. No. And when, when you look at the pattern from Abraham Breguet, 1801, and Breguet was a scientific person, you know, like he would go to uh, Venus now, he would not even make watches, it would be stupid of him to do this. Uh, never in the patent text did he mention the word gravity. Remember what the tourbillon was about at that time and what lubricants they used. Here we have synthetic lubricants, fantastic. They used animal grease, fish oil. So the problem that you have on a pocket watch, it's body temperature, so pretty, uh, you know, pretty high. And then you would put it on coffee tables next to the chimney, it could be burning, or there's no chimney, super cold. So the difference of temperature also was complicated. There are writings uh, of Breguet said, give me the perfect lubricant, I'll give you the perfect watch. So for us, at Jewel, that's what we say, I know it's not as sexy, we say the tourbillon is a mix of, of, of animal grease. Mm -hmm. 
We start the conversation this way, and then we have to rebuild it. And I agree with uh, William, the only reason why you would buy a tourbillon is because it, it, you admire it and you appreciate it. Okay. The rest, it is not for, for uh, efficiency. Oh, sorry. If I can just say, although they do not make a gyro tourbillon, they do do a, a tourbillon in more than one dimension, Vacheron Constantin with the armillary tourbillon. Do you have a response to, to, to this? Because it's a similar kind of concept to the gyro. So <clears throat> for us, the, um, we, we have been working on, on the twin axis tourbillon because we we wanted to have a, a better accuracy, basically, so we, we, we found that this system was uh, giving us a better accuracy. And uh, of course, the, for us, uh, we had also to, find, to, to, to fight against the weight. So that's why we have also implemented so many interesting solutions uh, inside this, this tobio. But uh, it remains like uh, you were talking about Formula One cars. For us, we do uh, something like four or five in a year. And all these movements are for, for unique pieces, collectors. And uh, it remains really, uh, I would say, they are, made, they are made exactly in the same way as uh, watchmakers used to make tourbillon maybe 100 years ago. So mm -hmm. it's really something, it's really a very rare uh, tourbillon that we are doing. Mm -hmm. William, you wanted to chime in? No, I just want to say, you know, geo tourbillon, three-dimensional, if your wrist uh, moves around as a normal human being, you don't really need tourbillon or geo tourbillon. I mean, you know, your wrist is basically the tourbillon. Mm -hmm. Mike, you wanted to... Yeah, man, I just go back. They're beautiful. They're beautiful objects to look at. They're works of art. And you come to the Turbion Workshop, you come visit Audemars Piguet. The work, Turbion Workshop's actually inside the museum. It's not a simulated workshop. This is where the Turbions are crafted by hand and they end up in the Royal Oaks. And when you meet these men and women who are cre creating and crafting these pieces, it really starts to blur the lines between art and technology. And they've also evolved quite a bit since the era in which Pierre mentioned. Our tests show a different accuracy. We do see that the traditional escapements, the double balance wheel on the tourbillon, there's without a doubt a slight improvement on accuracy with the tourbillon mechanism. So there is a functional aspect and we've evolved them consistently throughout time. I also wanna make a quick mention to the watch. Uh, William mentioned that very, very first tourbillon was also automatic, 1986, the first tourbillon in a series. It was designed by the successor of Gerald Genta, a woman named Jacqueline Dimier and perhaps one of the most important creators and designers in the history of watchmaking. She play, it was the first watch to have the tourbillon on the dial side. And there had been tourbillon scientific watches by Omega, Lieb, Patek Philippe, but she chose to put the tourbillon on the dial side for the aesthetic reason. And the watch was actually called the Ra. The tourbillon represented the sun, and then they had the rays coming off the sun. We have one on exhibition back over there in the booth, and I encourage you to go look at all the brands, but definitely stop by AP and have a look at that very, very first tourbillon. And what, and there's also two more quick points on this. It, more of that watch were produced than the history of tourbillons from 1801 through 1985. So that's crazy right off the bat. And also a quick sort of another little historical note, all of us up here, including Jor Mr. Jorn, who's not with us, a lot of the knowledge of Breguet comes from a gentleman who passed away a few years back, a guy named Jean-Claude Sabrier, who was a teacher for all of us up here on this stage. And a lot of the discussions and debates we're having on this topic, I would love to, I wish Jean-Claude were here to, uh, to give his remarks, because guys, I think he'd be, he'd, be, he'd be a little more on my side than yours on this one. <laughs> Right, can we have a next question? I think there was a gentleman in the fourth row, in the white shirt. Some very similar question, I think, was covered in the response to the survey. Oh, okay, thank you. Is there another question from the audience? Which complication do you all enjoy on your wrist the most? I'm, I'm a chronograph perpetual calendar guy. I kind of like those mm -hmm. uh, because it's kind of useful, actually. Oh, yeah. High five. High five. <laughs> And I think it, there's an interaction with the watch, with the chronograph, which is kind of fun. You know, it's the kid in me wants to play with the buttons. Uh, and the moon, the perpetual calendar, or something a little bit. But uh, one simple complication that I like is the resonance. I think it's the most poetic complication. Mm -hmm. The resonance from Jean is too heartbeat. You know, it's, it's really a, a very beautiful complication. Christian? Mm -hmm. So for me, I love, um, I would say, calendar watches simple calendar or, comp or perpetual calendar because I think this is also uh, you know this creating this precious, precious link between uh, watchmaking and astronomy and for me this link with the cosmos and something which is bigger than us so I love this idea of, of going of going forward 
Uh, I'm going to talk on behalf of uh, François Paul because well, he's the watchmaker. I'm, uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't know anything about watchmaking and how to even assemble a watch. We know that. You believe, but, believe yeah. this guy? Come on. Fair. I'm, I'm, I admit. But, but when you ask Francois Paul, what is your favorite watch? The next one. That, that's always his answer. And that's why Francois Paul, like Francois Paul didn't assemble this watch. He doesn't have the time for this. He does the prototyping. He does the first repairs to see if it's human error or mechanical uh, error. So he has to change things. But the rest, he said, I want to do the next one. Otherwise, it's boring. I, don't, I didn't work all my life to redo the same thing over and over again. I want to do the next one. Mm -hmm. I have a different answer, surprise. The word clock derives from the word cloca, which means bell. Time was heard before it was seen. At the origin of clock making water clocks in ancient China into the development of European mechanical clocks, no dials and hands. These were automated bell striking machines. This is a real ancient relationship that we have. The musicality of the minute repeater, the ancient relationship, hands down for me, the minute repeater. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Oh, for me as well. I gotta say that uh, I do really, I mean, I have a soft spot for pretty much every mechanical complication there is. I feel really bad saying this because it's like say, picking a favorite child. I know you, Suzanne. It's astronomy. It's astronomical watches. I like chronographs as well. You I do. like, uh, you know, I, you like I'm passionate about You like to wear chronos, but you like to talk about astronomy. Equation of time is also oh, super cool. Equation of time is badass. Equation of time, even though it's one of those indulgences that you kind of feel bad liking, but you do anyway because, you know, come on, who wouldn't? And uh, sunrise, sunset, also very good complication. William, are you like, just <laughs> cut it out. <laughs> Next question, anyone? Gentleman in the, the cap at the back. I hope it's not a crazy question, I guess. Uh, uh, two watch, seconds, watch just wait lovers, for the one. Watch lovers here. But the question is a little bit more personal to, uh, to the panelists. Uh, obviously, the relationship between man and time and oneself and the watch is pretty special. I'm wondering if you guys uh, have named your watches and if you could share uh, the name and why. Yes. You mean like we have a nickname for watches? Do you nickname? Do you name your watches? Do you baptize your watches? Mm -hmm. Nickname exhibition. Russian goes in there. Some of them uh, actually come with to, nicknames. To, 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 yeah, to give you uh, maybe uh, an answer. Personally, I don't give any nickname to, to my watches. However, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, uh, at the Heritage Department, we, we did an exhibition which, uh, which, which name was Nicknames, in which we were um, exhibiting watches that uh, collectors gave them names, yeah. like the Batsman, for example, yeah. or the T-Bird, yeah. or, uh, or so, some other names like that. So I think um, it's really, this is something that collectors, I don't know what you think, William, they talk of love, sometimes they are giving nicknames to watches, and these names are, you know, kept, and, 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 uh, and, and they are used also by, by clients and by people mm -hmm. who are wearing these watches. Yes, and you can follow the Hour Lounge on Instagram to find out more about these nicknamed watches that Christian is just telling us about. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, William? Yes, uh, it comes a lot from the community, from uh, internet, they, they give nicknames. I have a nickname for my watches, it's directed at my wife. Every time she asks me, she says, what's this? I said, this whole thing. Uh, but besides that, it's, uh, I think the community gives nicknames to watchers. Or, or sometimes one guy who owns one watch, like the Graves, you know, can name his watch, but that's pretty rare. Okay. We have, uh, we have one in the company also. Uh, we have a watch called the Chronomet Bleu, and it's, it's our Rolex Daytona at, at the level about this big. But uh, we have like two or three years waiting list on this. And we had to change this because I, I was in, in our New York boutique and we had like two young guys that came and they said, oh, do you carry the cordon bleu? Cordon bleu. So now we know like if, if, we, if somebody asks for this, like we know the guy is really not uh, too good, we say, in turn, he say, oh, he's, he's a cordon bleu. Meaning he doesn't know shit about watches. And we don't want to sell to him because that's, it's uh, irrelevant. So cordon bleu. Mm -hmm. Are there any nicknamed AP watches, Mike? I mean, there's of course like the Jumbo and, and the well-known ones, but, but it's an interesting, you know, one, we think of this as a contemporary phenomenon. If you look back at the history of Hamilton Watch Factory, all the products had nicknames. It, it's really fun to look back at the names. It's almost, it's really endearing to see that, how important that was to them. Um, for me personally, I, I do some uh, collecting with my brother, partly because 
he makes a little more money. It makes it a little bit easier for me to uh, get some of those pieces. And we got a watch with my late father back in 2003. It was, my, it was the last auction I was with at Christie's. You remember the auction, William. It was when I sold those Clapton watches, that first wave. And in that sale, there was an, an Audemars Piguet. So long before I joined the company, it was the first AP I acquired. It was from 2000, the auction was 2003. The watch had been exhibited in the 1939 World's Fair. And my father was a huge, huge World's Fair nut. So it's a platinum rectangular watch. It's unique. Every AP before 1951 is one of a kind. So when my brother and I are talking, I live in Switzerland now, he's in Texas, and I'm going to an event and something important or a personal thing, he'll say, are you, are you gonna wear the World's Fair? Yeah, I'm gonna wear it for Pops. So there you go. All right, guys, I think that's all that we have time for. I'd like to thank my panelists very much, William, Christian, Pierre, and Michael. I'd like to thank the FAT for giving us the chance to have this fascinating discussion and most of all the audience for being here and supporting Watches and Wonders Miami. Have a good afternoon, everyone. But wait, let's take a photo. Guys, 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 Pierre, Pierre, Pierre. Yeah. Which bar? We're going to take a photo.